This is the brand new Angmar Awakened Hero expansion for the Lord of the Rings the card game. Uh, I'm going to do an unboxing for you and then I'm also going to do a full card by card analysis so you can see what cards are included, how good they are, and I'm going to try to kind of relate it to um, new players who maybe have the core set and the, the starter decks uh, to see how these cards might support that kind of a card pool. Um, but I will say that this is not new content for the game. This is really just a repackaging of existing content. You can see here on the back of the box, it combines all the player cards from these seven previous expansions. There was the Lost Realm Deluxe Box and then those six adventure packs. So it's just taking all the player cards from those old expansions, putting them in one box, and then all the quest cards are gonna be put in a campaign box that's coming out later. So uh, let's unwrap it. Okay, here we go. One giant stack of player cards. Oh, and it just fell out. <laughs> and another giant stack of player cards. So this is just packing material. In fact, this box is extremely flimsy. This is not meant to hold anything long-term. It's just a giant empty box for packing. So um, the, oh, and there is a, little insert in here. It's going to give some flavor text. Uh, it's going to explain some of the rules for the new cards in here. There are side quests, which are brand new. These are a lot of fun. Uh, new keywords on the cards. Valor. This made an appearance in the starter decks. And that's basically it. Now on the back though, this is something new. They have designed two uh, deck lists that you can use uh, combining the core set and these player cards. So you can build a Dunedain deck and an Elves deck. I have not tried these yet. Um, one of the main comments people made is that in the Elves deck they expect you to use Arwen as your primary defender. Uh, good luck with that. <laughs> it's not going to work very well. Uh, however, if you play these together, I'm thinking, the Dunedain deck is really meant to take all the enemies. So if you play them together, uh, I think the Elves deck is going to be excellent in willpower, and so the Dunedain can help complement that to try to take all the enemies and take the heat from them. So. Uh, I'm excited to try those out, but uh, let's do the full card by card analysis. I'll show you what's here and what I think of them. Starting with just a high level overview here, these are the major archetypes that are supported in this box. I've kind of clustered them together here. Uh, the major support is for the Dunedain Rangers. It's a whole new archetype. It's a lot of fun to play. Then you've got the Noldor Elves, which are very different than the Sylvan Elves, uh, but very fun in their own right. Then you've got Gondor cards. You're definitely going to want these if you have the Gondor starter deck, because that starter deck kind of hinted at some support for the Valor mechanic, which is if your threat is 40 or higher, you get some boosts. Um, so these are all the cards that can add into that Valor mechanic and give you boosts if you go above that 40 threat threshold. Uh, then you've got the Ent cards. You've got three allies in an event. Really a lot of fun. Some of the best Ent allies in the game. Uh, then you've got the Victory Display cards, the Rossiel cards. It's a whole uh, interesting way to play the game. A lot of control over the encounter deck with these. Then you've got Side Quests, which is a whole brand new type of player card, which I'll go over later. Then you've got some Sylvan Allies. You're definitely going to want this Sylvan Ally if you have that Sylvan Starter deck. Then you've got some other support for some various archetypes like Hobbits and Dwarves and Rohan. And then some general use cards up here, which you can kind of use in any deck. Uh, so let's go through this in detail now, one cluster at a time. The Dunedain archetype is all about engaging enemies and then staying engaged with those enemies as long as you can. Uh, ideally, you want to be engaged with like one or two enemies at all times, because then you get lots of boosts and bonuses for doing that. Um, the main weakness of the archetype that you're going to want to prepare for is to deal with all the shadow cards that come your way. Okay, if you can have ways to uh, defend or cancel damage or cancel shadow effects or heal, those are all useful things to complement a good Dunedain deck. Um, starting out though, let's talk about the heroes and then we'll get into some of the key cards that are included in the box. Um, Amarthiel is a leadership hero. While you're engaged with at least one enemy, Amarthiel gains the tactics resource icon. So that's great. He can help you smooth out your resources. While you're engaged with at least two enemies though, you add an extra resource to his pool. 
every round. So gaining resources and smoothing out resources on a single card is really, really strong. And Amarthiel has the best defensive stat, uh, defense strength out of all the heroes that are included here. So he's kind of going to be your main primary defender. But if you can find a way to boost his defense, that's going to make him even better. So just be mindful of that. Uh, but he's a lot of he's a lot of fun. Tactics Aragorn is the other amazing hero in this pack. You can use him in so many different decks, uh, but he complements the Dunedain because each enemy you're engaged with gets minus one defense. So he makes it easier to kill every enemy that's engaged with you. So he's a killing machine and already three attack. He's sort of effectively a four attack hero, uh, which is one of the best in the game. And then he has a response. It says, after Aragorn participates in an attack that destroys an enemy, choose an enemy not engaged with you and engage that enemy. So if you're starting with two enemies engaged with you, you can kill an enemy and then pull another one to you so that you're still engaged with the same number of enemies. That's extremely helpful for then kind of thinning out um, the number of enemies on the table while still getting all the boosts for the Dunedain. Uh, so really, really fun hero to play with. That's it. Tactics Aragorn. Then you've got Halbarad. He's a leadership hero. He says, while you're engaged with at least one enemy, Halbarad doesn't exhaust to commit to the quest, which is pretty nice. That'll add two willpower to the quest. Um, and then you can optionally engage one additional enemy. Uh, normally you can only engage one. So this deck really needs to be able to control which enemies you're engaged with and how many. So this hero really helps you do that. Um, I haven't played with him often in my Dunedain decks. I usually like to play with Barivor from the core set. She adds a lower resource to the sphere, which is really handy. Uh, but if you play with just leadership and tactics, getting all three of these heroes together is really, really nice. So now let's get into some of the allies. You'll find a common theme here in that these next allies are going to be boosted based on how many enemies you're engaged with. So this is the Fornost Bowman. He's ranged and he gets attack boost based on how many enemies you're engaged with. Uh, Guardian of Arnor is the same thing for defense. He's sentinel and he gets plus defense for every enemy you're engaged with. Sarnford Sentry does the same thing for card draw. So when you play her, you draw cards based on how many enemies you're engaged with. Uh, it's difficult to set this up, but if you do, if you've got two, three, four enemies engaged with you, that extra card draw can mean the world of difference. So again, you can't play the lore allies unless you have a lore hero, so that lore Barivor is my favorite hero to splash in to get use out of this card and some others. Then you've got Warden of Anuminas, which is Spirit. Uh, this card gets plus one willpower for each enemy engaged with you. This is the hardest one to play, I'd say, because it starts at zero willpower. So you're getting no benefit initially, even though his other stats are really good. He can be a good defender in a pinch for a weak enemy. He's got two attack too. Uh, but at four cost, it's just steep. And um, so if you can find a way to reduce the cost, which I will show you in just a second here, um, and get you know three or four enemies engaged with you, this guy can be really, really strong. Now, this is the key enabler card in this archetype. Okay, so these allies are not cheap. Um, three and four cost for some of these, uh, for a lot of them actually. So this is the cost reducer for the Dunedain archetype. So you attach to Dunedain hero and then you exhaust this card in the planning phase to reduce the cost of the next Dunedain ally you play this phase by one for each enemy engaged with you. So you, if you can be engaged with two, three, four enemies, then you get free allies, essentially, or much cheaper allies. This is an essential card to play with. Now, Descendants of the Kings, also an amazing support card to include in a pinch. You get to ready uh, Dunedain characters based on how many enemies you're engaged with. Engage with three enemies, ready three characters. Really, really strong. The Ranger of Cardalon, I love this guy. He can pull off some really cool uh, combos and things, which I won't get into here, but he's a four cost ally. So paying for him outright is not bad. It's a well-rounded stat line that you're getting, but he sort of has a built-in sneak attack ability. So when you engage an enemy, you can play him from your hand for one cost, not four. Uh, really, really handy. And then at the end of the round, if he's still in play, then he goes back into your deck. You shuffle it into your deck. Um, you can play this outside of a Dunedain deck. Again, I think I said that, but uh, it's neutral. So it's easier to play and it's a lot of fun to kind of jump him in to deal with an enemy you've just engaged. 
Oh, another note, you can play this then during the, the, the uh, the staging step as well. If uh, some enemies come out during staging that engage you immediately, you can play him at that time. That can be really handy as well. Okay, Dunedain Hunter. He's a zero cost ally. What? Uh, well, the cost is built into his ability. Let's read it. Uh, it says, after he enters play, search the top five cards of the encounter deck for a non-unique enemy and you put it into play engaged with you. If no enemy enters play by this effect, though, then he whiffs and you have to discard him, unfortunately. Um, so, again, useful if you want to engage another enemy. And I think it's worth it because you're getting one willpower on Tactics Alley. That's really good. But three attack and three hit points. This is a solid stat line for zero cost. You are engaging an extra enemy, but ideally this whole deck is about planning to engage multiple enemies anyway. So if you can play this in planning phase, then you can combo it with, you know, the Sarn Ford Sentry to draw extra cards or the Air of Landil to reduce cost for something. So uh, there are many useful reasons for engaging an enemy during the planning phase where this guy can be really handy. Athalos can be used in lots of different decks. It is a healing card, much like uh, Lembas. If you've seen that card, that heals all damage from an ally and readies them. This heals all damage and you get to discard a condition attachment. So there are not many condition removal cards in the game. You get like one in the core set. This, and then I think there's one other uh, doomed events in the fourth cycle, but yeah, these cards are hard to come by that remove condition attachments. So it's very useful for that and uh, works in a Duna Nine deck, especially if you're taking a lot of shadow cards or you need to defend a lot, you'll probably need some healing. So Athalos is great for that. Sword of Numenor is a great card. It is non-unique, which means you can kind of dual wield, so to speak. You can put two of these cards on a single hero. It is restricted, so you can only have two of these uh, on a hero, but it gives plus one attack to a Dunedain or Gondor hero. Um, but the effect is pretty cool too. If you can kill an enemy with five or more hit points with this, then you add a resource to that hero's resource pool. Um, that can be really awesome for fueling anything, I guess. It's, it's a resource. Uh, but um, yeah, there aren't too many attack boosts in the core set. So getting another one like this just as a weapon is really nice to have. But this can fit well just in a Gondor deck as well. Uh, so pretty flexible card. Weatherstain Cloak is a situational card. Uh, it depends on the quest. There are some quests that have treacheries or enemies that will deal direct damage to you during the questing phase. So this protects you during the questing phase. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, I'll let you read that, but it's for ranger characters only. So you could use it in trap decks or in uh, Dunedain decks because most of them are also ranger traded. Uh, but it's, it's okay, it's just situational based on the quest. This Star Brooch is a very situational card. There are not many quests that will reduce your willpower. So this card is intended to protect you against effects that will reduce your willpower. Like I think uh, Redhorn Gate is the only one I can think of off the top of my head right now. Um, it's just, it's very situational. So if your quest you're playing does that, then this can help protect you. Ranger Summons is an interesting card. It is a signal which we'll get back to that in a minute. There's another signal here as well, which we'll go over later. Um, you can only play this if you control a Dunedain hero, and then you shuffle one copy of this card into the encounter deck. Okay, so these two cards go together. When you play this card, you include this just, you don't actually put this in your deck, you put this on the side on the table, and it is an encounter card. Uh, so that's kind of a new concept. So when you play this, you shuffle one of these into the encounter deck. And when this gets drawn from the encounter deck, it surges. So you'll draw an extra card after that. But with this guy's ranged sentinel, and then you choose a player to put this guy under their control. And then you either deal two damage to an enemy or you place two progress on a location. That's really cool. It's almost like a Gandalf. You get to choose some different options. He's got really good stats. You get the ally. The only problem is that this is unpredictable. Okay, you summon him to the encounter deck, but then you're never sure when he's gonna come up. So his effect may whiff. I mean, it's, I guess it's difficult uh, to not have an enemy or a location, so it's almost always useful, but you're not gonna 
always find him. Um, especially in a solo game, these cards are less effective. If you're playing a multiplayer game with two, three, four players, you're gonna see this guy come up more often, so it's better in a multiplayer game. Uh, but really cool if you can do it. And the reason I wanted to point out the signal trait is for this ally. Okay, this is the Weather Hills Watchman. He's a basic Dunedain ally. The stats are not great, but it's only two cost, and you get two willpower, or sorry, two hit points. But it says, after Weather Hills Watchman enters play, you search the top five cards of your deck for a signal. So he can find this signal card or this other signal card, the Dunedine message, which again, I'll talk about later. So you can search the top five cards of your deck for a signal card and you add it to your hand and you shuffle the other card back in your deck. Um, so it's, it's nice to get some extra card draw in the deck. Um, if you don't have a lot of signals though, uh, he's not worth playing on his own. There are a bunch of other signal attachments that came from the first cycle in the game, the Shadows of Mirkwood cycle. So if you don't have that cycle, this card is less useful. Uh, but if you do, then this guy can help search for those and it's really nice. All right, this card can be a general use card, but it's best in a Dunedain deck. Uh, you play it in the combat phase before you resolve attacks, and you get to choose an enemy not engage with you, and you engage the enemy and then discard a shadow card from them. So you can pull an enemy to you and deal with one of the worst problems of having enemies is the shadow effects. So this can be a great way to uh, deal with their shadow cards. I personally haven't used this card in my Dunedain decks, but I can see where it's useful. And again, you don't really, it, there's no trait restriction, so you don't need a Dunedain deck to play with this card. This is one of the best cards in the box. Uh, Distant Stars is excellent. It's an action, you exhaust a ranger or scout character. So you don't need a Dunedain deck to play this, but it works in Dunedain, of course, because they're mostly rangers. You do that, you exhaust a character to discard a non-unique active location. Just discard it for good. And then you search the encounter deck, the entire encounter deck, or the discard pile for a non-unique location and make it the active location. So you get to swap the active location for any other location you want. But what that means is you also get to bypass the travel effect on that location when you swap it. So it gives you an enormous amount of control over the encounter deck for zero cost, just exhausting one of those Ranger Scout characters. So it's an incredibly manageable cost to get a great effect for controlling which locations you're going to, um, you're going to deal with. So now this is sort of similar to Distant Stars, but it's for enemies. Okay, so it is a one cost. You exhaust a Dunedain or Ranger hero though that's that's a that that that's a hard cost to pay for one cost and exhausting a hero that's tough but you get to cancel an enemy card canceling means you ignore everything on the card you ignore surge the when revealed effects everything all the keywords on the card are ignored when you cancel it so that's good but you get to you have to reveal another encounter card after that so when could you use this? Okay, I could see this in a Dunedain deck if you have an enemy turned up that you're not prepared to deal with. If it is a really big bad enemy and you can't engage it, it would ruin your board state, then this can push it back to the encounter deck and then you draw another card. That's good. But also in a, in a trap deck, uh, you, we saw some trap cards in the uh, Gondor starter deck, so if you have that, um, that trap deck archetype is all about trying to get enemies trapped in specific traps, uh, but some enemies don't work well with that. So this can let you control a bit which enemies get trapped. Uh, so I can see its usefulness there as well, but it's just, it's a heavy cost and a situational card at best. So, you know, take it for what it's worth. Expert Trackers is a better card. It's, for, it's location control. So after you engage an enemy, you exhaust a scout or ranger to put progress on a location uh, based on the printed threat strength of that enemy. That's pretty good. Uh, it's just you really want it to hit with like a three threat strength enemy. I mean, if you can get a four threat strength, that's amazing. That can deal with most locations in the game. Um, so pretty cool card. That's it for the Dunedain. All right, let's talk about the Noldor archetype. Uh, now the Noldor elves are all about the discard pile. They can discard cards for benefit. Uh, they can also pull cards out of the discard pile. There are some of their cards that can only be played when they're in the discard pile. Um, so it's very interesting, and really to make this deck work, you do need a lot of card draw. 
So that's where Aristor comes in. He says he draws three additional cards at the beginning of the resource phase. So turn one, you're getting a 10 card hand. That's incredible. But at the end of the round, you discard all cards in your hand. So essentially, he's gonna be, for every round after the first one, he's gonna be drawing four cards every single round and then discarding the rest that you don't play. He changes how you play the game, honestly. Like, it, it's game-changing, and he doesn't need to be played in a Noldor deck. He just solves card draw for any deck. You don't need any other card draw effects to make a deck work if he's in it. Uh, the major problem with Aristor is that you're gonna be seeing your entire deck you know, multiple times if you have a way to shuffle your discard pile back in, he can cycle through your entire deck. It's just, you're, you're not gonna be able to have enough resources to pay for all the cards, usually. So that's where Arwen comes in. If you pair them together with Arwen, you get to discard a card from your hand and add a resource to a Noldor hero's resource pool or to Aragorn's resource pool. That's kind of cool. So she can even support the Dunedain archetype. If uh, you're playing with Ar uh, Aragorn on the table, she can pass resources to him. So with Aristor though, you got a four card hand typically, so you're usually not able to play all four of those cards. So getting to discard one of them to add a resource will let you play even more of those cards that he draws. So together they make an excellent combo, but Arwen is one of the strongest heroes in the game for solving that major problem of resource generation. Uh, with the three willpower as well, she is just an excellent hero overall. Now getting to some of the other Noldor cards here, this is the Elven Jeweler. You discard two cards from your hand to put Elven Jeweler into play from your hand under your control. So essentially, you don't have to pay this two resource cost to play her. You could just discard two cards and put her in. Um, extremely handy for getting allies on the table for this deck that's all about discarding cards. So most useful in an Aristor deck. Again, two cards is a high cost in any other kind of deck, but if you're playing Aristor and you're drawing all those cards, She's really, really good. Next is Lindir. He is unique. Uh, you can, well, it says after Lindir enters play, if you have less than three cards in your hand, you draw until you have three cards in your hand. This is really, really cool and really fun in a Noldor deck because you're trying, at least with an Aristor deck, to empty your hand. So if you have zero cards and he's the only card left, if you play him, then you draw three cards right away. Um, that's awesome. Uh, so you just have to time it right, but he's got a solid stat line as well. So, uh, you know, three cost is, it's not nothing, but it, it definitely is a, is a great card for this deck. Galdor of the Havens is a great unique ally. He costs four, but he's got a really good stat line of four hit points. So after one or more cards are discarded from your hand, draw a card. Now I said you don't really need card draw effects in an Aristor deck, but this is just really good in a Noldor deck, period, because you're going to be discarding lots of cards. So to get an extra card from it once per round, uh, extremely useful in this deck. Now Elven Spear is one of the cards that gives you benefits for discarding cards. It boosts your attack strength on a hero up to three times for discarding one card. Okay, so if you discard three cards, you get plus three attack. The only problem with this is that you, you don't often play tactics with Noldor. So if you can find a way to get this into play, maybe if you're playing a two-player game and one player has tactics, you can put this in their deck to put it on one of your Noldor or Sylvan heroes. It's nice. The only problem is that um, if you have other effects that can discard cards for benefit, this one tends to get lost. You may not use this as often as some of the other effects. But if you need that attack boost, it's great in an old or deck. Steed of Imladris. You attach it to a spirit hero or, or a Noldor hero. So this is a good general use card if you're just playing spirit. Uh, it's restricted. But then after the attached hero commits to a quest, discard a card from your hand to place two progress on the active location. For one cost, this is a great card. Um, you can do a lot of other cool things to help support this card. For instance, it's a mount. So this works well in a Rohan deck that supports mounts, um, but it's just good location control. It can help you quest through a difficult location that's the active one. Uh, it's a good card for one cost especially. The Silver Harp is a two cost attachment. You attach to a spirit hero. Again, don't need to play a Noldor deck to play this card, but 
after a card is discarded from your hand, you exhaust Silver Harp to return that card to your hand. And in any Noldor deck, this is going to be extremely handy if you're keeping your hand size up as you discard cards. Now, Elven Light is one of the best cards in the game, period. It is an extremely strong card draw effect, and it plays perfectly with Arwen's ability. So let me pull her back here so you can see them side by side. So it's a little bit tough to wrap your head around at first, but basically you can only play Elven Light when it's in your discard pile. So the first requirement to play Elven Light is that you need to get it in your discard pile somehow. So one of the best ways to do it is with Arwen, who can discard a card to gain a resource. So discard this card so you can get it in your discard pile. You can also get a card in your discard from Eowyn, from the core set. But once it's in there, you pay one cost to return Elven Light to your hand from the discard pile, and then you draw one card. Okay, so essentially when you do that, you're drawing two cards into your hand. You're drawing Elven Light into your hand and an extra card. So this fuels the Noldor archetype for sure because you're needing to discard lots of cards, so you need to draw them. But this is just one of the best card draw effects in the game because it's repeatable. If you can get this in your, in your discard pile, then you can regularly pay a resource to draw an extra card. The fact that it's repeatable is incredible and it makes an excellent combo with Arwen. Tale of Tenuviel is sort of a linking card between the Noldor and Dunedain archetypes, uh, but it can also just be a good card to use if you have Arwen and Aragorn on the table. Uh, essentially, you exhaust a Noldor to ready a Dunedain character, or vice versa. So I can exhaust Arwen to ready Aragorn, or exhaust Aragorn to ready Arwen, and then you, until the end of the phase, add the exhausted character's printed willpower to the other character's willpower attack and defense. Okay, this is really cool. So if you have, again, I'm gonna pull Arwen back here. She's got three willpower. So if you exhaust Arwen to ready Aragorn in the combat phase, you can give plus three to Aragorn's attack and defense in that phase. That's incredible. So if you have other readying effects, you can utilize his defense and attack multiple times and get plus three with that is so good. Um, yeah, this is an excellent card and it only cost one. So love that card. Fair and Perilous. You choose a Noldor or Sylvan character and then until the end of the phase, you add that character's willpower to its attack. All right, this is most useful for Noldor characters that have a high willpower value, of course, because you're adding three willpower to the attack in this case. Uh, this can be used to great effect with Glorfindel. There's a couple versions of Glorfindel. Uh, actually, there's like three versions of Glorfindel, but he has three willpower and three attack. So you would get a six attack, essentially, with this card. It's only one cost to do that. So it, this is a great card if you can find the right character to use it on. All right, last card in this cluster here. This is the Lords of the Eldar. It's a three cost event. This is specifically for Noldor characters. Uh, this makes their archetype sing at the end. So it can only be played from your discard pile, much like Elven Light. So you have to get it in your discard pile somehow, which is not hard to do in an, in an Noldor deck. But then you place Lords of the Eldar on the bottom of your deck from your discard pile. Then until the end of the round, all Noldor characters get plus one to all their stats. It's awesome when you get a bunch of characters on the table. This is sort of like a mid to late game card to really push in the end of the quest to win. Uh, this is very strong in a Noldor deck. Um, it, you can repeat this effect if you get near the end of the game and your deck is very small. You're putting this card from your discard pile to the bottom of your deck, so if you can get to the bottom of your deck, then you can repeat this over and over again. Very strong, very fun effect. You gotta build around it though, much like most of the Noldor cards, but uh, that's it for this cluster. All right, let's talk about the Gondor cards that come in this pack. Uh, the first is an ally called Ingold. Uh, he gets plus one willpower for each hero you control with at least one resource in its resource pool. 
This kind of plays into one of the ideas that was developed in the Gondor archetype where you want resources on the heroes to get some benefit. So like Boromir, leadership Boromir, uh, you'll find him in the, in the Gondor starter deck. Uh, he gets plus one attack to every, every Gondor ally if he has a resource in his pool. So there, there's a couple other card effects that, that require a resource on a hero. So this ally kind of plays into that and he gets a really nice willpower boost for that. So, I mean, if you think about it, it's kind of really costly. If you pay three and then you have to have three on your heroes to get the most use out of him, but it does allow you to be flexible and that you can spend those resources if you need them, but if you don't need them right away, getting three extra willpower is really good. Now, the rest of these cards are going to play into the Valor mechanic, which is if your threat is 40 or higher, you get boosts. So again, the Gondor starter deck had some hints of this and some support, some actually some very important key support cards for that idea, the Valor mechanic, but this pack really fleshes it out. So if you have the Gondor starter deck, you're going to want this pack for all these cards that you're about to see. The first is the Veteran of Os Giliath. Uh, so he gets plus one to his stats when your threat is 40 or higher. For three cost, that is going to be an excellent stat line to benefit from. This ally is one of the best defensive allies in the entire game. This is Honor Guard. So the Honor Guard has got a response. He says, exhaust Honor Guard to cancel one point of damage just dealt to a character. I can't stress how useful and how important damage cancellation is in this game. Damage cancellation can save your characters. Healing is sort of the aftermath. If you can survive an attack, healing can take away the damage that was already done, but it, healing can't save a character from dying. Uh, the Honor Guard can, though. So if you just, say, get a nasty shadow effect that deals that extra damage that kills a hero, this can save you. Um, and it can cancel a damage dealt to any character anywhere on the board. So having three of these will cancel three damage every round. That can help you with attacks, but it can also help you with archery. It can help you with direct damage done from the encounter deck, like from treachery cards. This guy is amazing. And then if you're in Valor, then you exhaust and discard Honor Guard to cancel up to five points of damage just dealt to a character. That's incredible. Um, haven't used that effect very often, but if you need to defend a really nasty attack, this guy can do it. Now we've got a bunch of events that have a basic effect and a valor effect. I'm not going to read the text on all of these, I'll just kind of give you the overview, but essentially this card lets you ready sentinel characters. Uh, the valor effect lets you ready all sentinel characters on the table. The rallying cry, the artwork kind of gives away where this is useful. This is useful in a Rohan deck. I have never used this card because it, it's expensive. And I usually have other ways to do something similar, but this lets you return allies that leave play to your hand instead of the discard pile. So Rohan cards do that all the time. They leave play and go to the discard. So this can let you fetch them back, which can be nice, but there's lots of other ways to do that. And leadership is not the best sphere for Rohan for most of those effects, especially not in the starter deck. So I haven't used this very often. Horn's Cry is really good. It reduces the attack value on all enemies. Okay, the Valor effect boosts it to minus three attack on all enemies. That's incredible, especially in a Dunedain deck where you're dealing with lots of attacks. Hour of Wrath is one of my favorite cards in this entire box. It's so fun. It costs four, but it's so worth it. You choose a hero, and until the end of the phase, the chosen hero doesn't exhaust to attack or defend. So if you've got a mega hero like Aragorn, who's good at defending and attacking, you don't exhaust him to do all the attacks and all the defenses. It's so, so good. And in Valor, you choose all of the heroes for one player. They don't exhaust to defend or attack. So fun. I love this card so much. Doom hangs still. Um, it's a planning action until the end of the round. Players don't raise their threat from questing unsuccessfully. That's interesting. So you can kind of focus on enemies for a round where you don't have to worry about failing questing. You still draw encounter cards, but you can just focus all your attention on combat for one phase. That's pretty cool, or for one round. But the Valor one is interesting. You raise each player's threat by two, but you skip the quest phase. So you don't even add encounter cards. 
So it kind of puts a halt on the game when you play this. It's five cost, but I can see this being very useful uh, in especially certain quests or as a Hail Mary card. Um, I've never used it personally though. All right, this is Hope Rekindled. This, this lets you find event card that have Valor triggers. And this is cool. So you actually get to reduce the cost of that event by two when you play this card. That's one of the major problems with these Valor events is that they're pretty expensive. So this card essentially acts as two resources for when you play those cards. That's really good. But when you're in Valor mode, then you get to search the top 10 cards of your deck for an event that has the Valor trigger and add it to your hand. So that's the other problem, I guess, is finding these events when you need them and finding the right event for the right time. So this card can help you do that. This Hope Rekindled is just an, an enabler for this archetype. And the last card of the stack is Favor of the Valar. It's a three cost. This is what a Valar deck needs, okay? Because you're playing with fire when you get up to 40 threat. You may threat out and lose the game. So this says you attach this card to the player's threat dial. And you can only have one of these per player, but when you would be eliminated by reaching your threat elimination level, instead, discard favor of the Valar and reduce your threat to five less than your threat elimination level, and you're not eliminated. So it saves you from losing the game. But what's interesting about this is that it doesn't matter how far I guess how far you would have lost by. So like if you're a 49 threat and you just raise your threat by, I don't know, seven, this reduces your threat then by 11 because you go then down to 45, which is five below your threat elimination level. So for three costs, you could potentially be reducing your threat by a crazy amount. So really good in a Valor deck. It's also one of the key cards that you can use to beat one of the hardest quests in the cycle, Karn Doom. Uh, because there's one, well, I won't spoil it, but it's a good card for the Karn Doom quest if you are looking for a way to beat it. So that's it for the Valor cards. These are five cards that support sort of a mini archetype that all has to do with the victory display. Uh, really, the first two key cornerstone pieces are these events. Uh, it says, limit three copies of Leave No Trace in the victory display, okay? But then in response, after a non-unique location is explored, add Leave No Trace to the victory display to add that location to the victory display. So after you travel somewhere or explore something, then you kind of get rid of this card with that location and both are added to the victory display, which is to the side of the table. This does the same thing for enemies. After you destroy an enemy, you add this and that enemy to the victory display. And the reason you wanna do that is for these next few cards. Okay, so Rossiel is a hero. Uh, she has a, you know, okay stat line to start with, but if the active location shares a trait with a location in the victory display, Rossiel gets plus two willpower. So she becomes a four willpower hero. In, in most quests, all or most of the locations will share a trait together. If you're underground in Moria, for instance, almost all the locations have underground traits on them. Or if you're in Mirkwood, almost all of them have the forest trait on them, as an example. So getting one location in the victory display is usually all you need to get this boost. The same thing would apply to enemies. Most quests have a single kind of an enemy. Maybe, you know, in Mirkwood, you've got orcs and spiders, but you know, in, in these other quests in the cycle, you'll have lots of undead enemies or lots of orcs only. So getting one enemy in the victory display is usually enough to get this plus two defense boost, which gets her up to four defense. That's that's what Baragon is from, you know, from the Gondor starter deck. That's an excellent defensive willpower boost for it. So she's not essential to this archetype, but she can get some really cool boosts if you if you play this and set it up properly. The other reason you're gonna want cards in the victory display is that this card lets you cancel, that's right, cancel, that means you ignore the entire card, all surge effects, all keywords, everything on it. You ignore if you, uh, well, let me just read it. So it says, after a card is revealed from the encounter deck, cancel its effects and discard it if there is a card of the same title in the victory display. So 
you'll want to use these cards up here to find the cards that you're having the most trouble with or the ones that you know are just the worst effects of the game, especially ones that have Surge on them. And then you can use this card to cancel every future copy of it. And what's awesome is that you don't replace the card after canceling it. You just cancel it and you don't draw another card of it. So this is one of the main reasons to play this deck is that you get ultimate control over the encounter deck. All right, lastly is Keen as Lances. Oh, I'm sorry, I haven't been saying the titles of these cards. It's The Door is Closed, Rossiel, then None Return and Leave No Trace. That's the titles. Okay, this last one, Keen as Lances. It says you reduce the cost to play Keen as Lances by one for each card worth no victory points in the victory display. Okay, so none of these cards that I showed you before have victory points on them. So every time you put a none return or a leave no trace in the victory display, you're reducing the cost of this card. So if you can get this down to zero, that's I guess the ultimate goal, but even if it, you don't get it all the way down, the effect on this is just so good because when you play this, it says you add Keenan's Lances to the victory display, then choose one. Add two resources to a hero's resource pool, draw three cards, wow, or reduce your threat by four. So kind of similar to Gandalf from the core set where you get to choose one of three options based on what you need at the time. Having options on a card is always good. But what's cool is that even playing one Kena's Lances will reduce the cost of all future Kena's Lances. So all three of these cards add themselves to the victory display. In addition to the, maybe the enemies or locations you're adding, this can quickly reduce to zero. And then you're getting some awesome effects for it. And the fact that this is neutral makes it even better. So on its own, not really that useful, too expensive, but if you combine this with other cards, and if you can even get this in multiple decks in a multiplayer game, one of these will reduce the cost for all of the other players at the table, so it could be really, really cool with that. Sadly, I haven't had to set that up yet because none of my friends have this card yet, but hey, if you can get that in a multiplayer game, that's super fun. So that's the victory display cards. Next, let's talk about the Ents. All right, so if you want to build a full Ent deck, these are really important, but the essential pieces are going to be in some of the Saga boxes. I think it's the Treason of Saruman and Land of Shadow. I think both of those have Ent cards, maybe just Treason of Saruman. But the other pack is the, uh, the Antlered Crown, which has Treebeard Ally and uh, the Booming Ent. Okay, those kind of complete the Ent archetype here, but these cards don't need to be used in a specific Ent deck. They're just awesome cards, period. Starting with the Darren Dingle Warrior, it's two cost for some really good stats. He's Sentinel. It's not easy to find Sentinel allies, so that's awesome already. He can't have restricted attachments, which is also a common thing across all these. And all of the Ent cards enter play exhausted. I think this is just super fun and thematic, even though it's not a, you know, it's a negative cost here. Uh, but you kind of have to rouse the Ents because they're slow, right? That's their whole theme. So when you play it, you can't use it that round unless you find a way to ready it or unless you just wait until the next round. So they are delayed when they come out, but they're cheap and he has an amazing ability. He says, while Darren Dingle Warrior is defending, it gains action, deal one damage to this card to give it plus three defense for this attack. Limit once per at per attack. Uh, having a five defense sentinel character with three hit points is bonkers good. Uh, the only thing is you're gonna need a way to heal this guy because to use that ability, you have to deal it a damage. But that's where this Welling Hall Preserver comes in. Okay, he has the same two costs. After he readies, you heal one damage from an Ent character. So having this guy in play can let you uh, reuse the Darren Eagle Warrior's ability over and over and over again because he can heal him. So excellent allies, the two of these guys. And at a three willpower, whew, that is really good. Okay, Beachbone is a unique and he has the same two costs and he has a response. After Beachbone is declared as an attacker, deal one damage to him to deal X damage to the defending enemy. 
X is the amount of damage on Beach Bone. All right, this is really cool. So there are some other end cards. Uh, one of them, shoot, uh, what is it called? End Draft is the name of the card. It lets you boost hit points on any character for controlling an end. So if you can get maybe six hit points on Beach Bone, that if he has four damage on him and you add an extra damage, you're dealing five direct damage to the defending enemy. That's insane. So if you, again, can get the healing effect to repeat Beachbone's ability, you can start just mowing down enemies, doing direct damage to them. That's a lot of fun to do, and he's got great stats overall as well. Lastly, we have an event. So after an end character takes any amount of damage, which you can see two of them have abilities built in that can damage themselves, you ready that character, ready the end, then that character gets plus three attack till the end of the phase. That is really good for one cost. Not only do you get the attack boost, but you also ready the character to attack multiple times. So great card for the Ents. All right, next let's talk about the side quests. Okay, these are player cards, even though they look like quest cards, so they go in your deck. Uh, all of these side quests are limit one per deck, so you can only have one copy in your deck at a time. But you play the cost, uh, pay the cost from your hand, it's one in this case, to put this next to the other quest deck. And then the idea is here that when you are in the quest phase and you're deciding which characters commit, you also are going to choose which quest you're going to go for on that round. So you can go for this side quest or the normal quest deck from the encounter. Uh, you can choose that each and every round uh, from the available side quests. Uh, so there are encounter side quests coming up in this next Angmar cycle uh, that you'll be able to choose from, but these are the player side quests. So the, it's a high cost where you're paying one and you have to get six progress tokens on this card, but the effects are almost always incredible. If you can finish these side quests, this one will let you search, will let each player search the top 10 cards of their deck for an ally and put it into play. That means you don't pay the cost. So you get a free ally from the top 10 cards of your deck. Every player gets to do that if you complete the side quest. That's incredible. This sadly is probably the worst side quest in the box by far. Um, it's zero cost, but you need eight quest points and it turns the quest into a battle quest, which means characters use their attack instead of their willpower when you are questing them with them. So that's interesting. This, this is a theme from the uh, Heirs of Numenor cycle, um, but the effect is just not as good. It's very situational. It says when the stage is defeated, each player may choose and discard one non-unique enemy engaged with them. You don't often have one enemy engaged with every player at the table. And even if you do, getting eight quest points on this, you're using your attackers to do that. So if you fall short of this eight quest point value with all of your attackers that you're using, then you're totally vulnerable after that. So if you're trying to kill all the enemies, you know, you might as well just attack the enemies normally, unless they're just really difficult enemies. They have to be non-unique though. So some of the strongest enemies are unique. It's just, this is a very situational card. I, I don't think I can ever find a good use for this. If you can, great, and I'm sure there are some niche uses for it and maybe some quests, but it's just not a good general use card. All right, Double Back is a great card. Zero cost for four quest points to finish it, and then every player reduces their threat by five when it's finished. That's a great effect. This is a side quest that also helps the victory display archetype that I just showed you. Okay, when you defeat the stage, the first player searches the top X cards of the encounter deck for a non-objective card worth no victory points, and you add it to the victory display. You put the remaining cards back in any order. X is the number of players in the game plus four. So if you're playing a four-player game, you're searching eight cards, and you're picking one of them to add to the victory display. This really enables that victory display deck because you can find the card that you want in there the most. Uh, the car that you really want to cancel later with the doors closed, or even if you don't use a victory display deck, it's still really good to get those nastiest cards out of the deck. Gather information is the neutral side quest, and it's probably the best one that comes in the pack. 
Uh, it says when the stage is defeated, each player may search their deck for one card and add it to their hand. You search the entire deck. This is, I think, one of the only universal searching your entire deck abilities. I can think of one other, and it comes with the Dream Chaser cycle, but this ability to search your whole deck for one key card is so good. So if you could get this out early, this can enable everyone's deck to run smoothly because every player gets to do that. I love this card so much. The only sad thing is that you can only put limit one per deck, like all these side quests, so it's hard to find these, but that's where this card comes into play, okay? This is an event card you get. It's a signal, uh, so you can fetch it with that Weather Hills Watchman. It costs one, but you search your entire deck for a side quest and you add it to your hand. So this will let you basically, essentially think of it as adding extra copies of these side quests to your deck. It, yes, it does cost one, but the nice thing is that you get to pick the side quest that you want at the time you need it. So that's pretty cool. And lastly is an ally that kind of supports this archetype. Uh, it's a Dunedain Scout, three costs, which is pretty high, but uh, East Road Ranger gets plus two willpower when committed to side quests. So that's a three willpower for three cost. If you're doing side quests, that's pretty darn good. Uh, this will be best in quests that also have additional side quests for them. Like in the Angmar Awaken cycle, there are encounter side quests. So this ally can really help for those as well. But that's it for the side quests. If you've made it this far in the video and you find this kind of thing helpful, please consider liking it so that more people can find it. And I do have more videos planned, so definitely consider subscribing too. Here we've got a few cards that are going to support some specific archetypes that you've already maybe seen developed. Uh, so these are two new Sylvan allies, which are going to help out if you have the, uh, the Sylvan starter deck product. Uh, this card especially is the key card that I would say in any Sylvan deck. Uh, this makes the engine keep going. Sylvan decks really rely on their events to be able to bounce allies in and out of play. This card, when you play it, first of all, interesting, it can't attack or defend. It can only quest. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Uh, but after Galadrim Weaver enters play, shuffle the top card of your discard pile into your deck. So after you play one of those key events, especially like the host of the Galadrim, uh, then you can return it into your deck so it can be found again with like your Galadrim Minstrels and things like that. So this keeps your deck filled with the cards that you need it to in order to keep the Sylvan engine running. So really, really important. This, sadly, is probably one of the least useful Sylvan allies, although, again, in certain decks can be really useful if you're going to support a really combat-heavy deck, maybe, where you're, or, or maybe if you're going to be having a lot of archery in a certain quest. When you play this Galadrim Healer, uh, then you choose a player to heal one damage from each hero controlled by that player. So I've never used this card, but I could see it being useful in certain Sylvan decks. All right, Eothane is a Rohan character. Uh, it's four cost, it's unique, but after a Rohan ally is discarded from play by a card effect, ready Eothane. So clearly this is specifically meant for the Rohan archetype. The only problem is that there's not a lot of leadership Rohan stuff in the starter deck, for sure. And then, you know, it's sort of developed later. There are a few good leadership Rohan heroes. So if you are playing with leadership Rohan, then this is a good one because there's lots of times that you're gonna discard allies by a card effect. Uh, but there it is, so you can use the stats multiple times. Now, the next two cards go together. This is Hero Mary and the Hobbit Pony. Uh, Mary is a spirit hero. This is one of my favorite hero cards in the game. I love this card. Mary lets you control your threat. He can reduce your threat by a lot, so, so much so that you may even end up with a lower threat than you started with. Um, so he's a two willpower, six threat cost hero already, that's good. Uh, but then after an enemy is revealed from the top of the encounter deck, you exhaust Mary to reduce your threat by that enemy's threat strength. So you'd hope that most enemies are two or three threat strength, that's reducing your threat by that amount. That's incredible. The only problem is that if you are planning to use this threat reducing ability, you're not gonna get use out of his willpower. So that's where the Hobbit Pony comes in. This is sort of his trusty steed. It's a zero cost uh, attachment. You attach to a Hobbit hero, so this really goes well on Mary. But it's a quest action. It says, if the attached hero is not committed to the quest yet, then you exhaust the hero and the Hobbit Pony to commit the attached hero to the quest. So what this lets you do, if you have Hobbit Pony on Mary, you 
are able to wait until you see which enemies are revealed from staging before deciding whether you want to reduce your threat or if you, let's say you didn't reveal any enemies or maybe you just revealed like a one threat cost enemy, you don't think that's worth it, then you can, after you've seen everything, commit Mary to the quest after all that's done. That's really, really cool. So I love Hero Mary for controlling your threat. Here's another Hobbit card. This isn't specifically geared towards Hobbits, I don't think. Like, it's good to have Hobbit allies in a Hobbit deck, but you can use this in lots of different decks. Um, it's, uh, I don't know, I, I'm a little iffy on this card. It's two cost, two willpower, which is good, but it says forced. When the active location is explored, place Curious Brandy Buck on the bottom of its owner's deck. Well, that's terrible, but uh, that makes sense when you look at the response. It says, after you travel to a location, put Curious Brainy Buck into play from your hand. That means he's free after you travel to a location. Okay, so you got a zero cost ally that adds two willpower for a single location. Because after you explore it, then he goes away. That could be okay. I could even see this better with like some shenanigans where if you're playing decks that draw through your entire deck regularly, like an Aristor deck, for instance, then you may be able to repeat this ability over and over again. If you can draw this guy from the top of your deck, play him, he goes away, but then you draw him immediately again, that could be pretty cool. But those are really, you know, few and far between. You're, you're not gonna be playing decks a lot where you're drawing through that much. So, I don't know, I'm kind of lukewarm on him. It costs a card slot is the biggest cost here because even if you get him into play for free, he goes away. So you're spending a whole card to do that temporarily. So anyway, there he is. The Longbeard Sentry, uh, he, this is a great ally, general use. You don't need to use him in a dwarf deck, but he does fuel the mining dwarf deck where you're trying to discard cards from the top of your deck. So Longbeard Sentry, he discards two cards from the top of your deck as an action to give Longbeard Sentry Sentinel and plus one defense until the end of the phase. Limit once per phase. So having a three cost, three defense, three hit point, sentinel ally is really good. So typically you're not going to be drawing through your entire deck in a game unless you're playing like a crazy dwarf mining deck where you got lots of discard abilities. If you put this guy in a generic deck though, those two discarded cards, you can kind of just pretend that they were on the bottom of your deck and you wouldn't see them anyway. So this cost is really, in most cases, not even a cost. And in some cases, if, if you are playing a Dwarf Mining deck, it could be a benefit uh, to do that. So, but again, the cost for the defense that you get as a Sentinel ally, that's really good. Love that guy. Dory Hero, he's a Tactics Hero Sentinel. This is considered by many players one of the worst heroes in the game. His ability doesn't quite make sense to use regularly. It says, response, after another hero is declared as a defender, exhaust Dory to add his defense to the defending hero's defense for this attack. You're exhausting two heroes for a single defense. That's a really heavy cost to pay. Yes, you're able to, you know, you're able to do this after you see a shadow cards effect, Oh no, I'm sorry, you're not. You're not even able to do that, it's a response. So after you declare the defender, so you're not even sure if you're gonna need this extra defense when you do this. If it were a combat action, I could see that as being you know, a little more useful, but as a response, it's super situational. It's really hard to build around. This is not a general use hero. Uh, yeah, that's about all I can say about that. So getting to this long defeat card, this is one of my favorite cards in the pack. The Long Defeat says you attach to a quest in play. This could be a side quest or one of the main quest cards. And after you defeat that quest, each player can either draw two cards or heal up to five damage from among characters they control. This is so good, uh, especially for quests with archery damage. You can start to pick off all those damages from among all of your characters. It doesn't heal it from a single character, but from any characters you want. And every player gets to do that. So this gets even better in multiplayer, but you can certainly play this in a solo deck as well. Ranger Provisions is a uh, resource boost, which is cool. You attach it to a location. When you explore the location, the first player adds one resource to each of their hero's resource pools. 
So you spend one to give three resources to a player. The only problem is in multiplayer with these kinds of cards, it's hard to choose who gets the resources. It's hard to control that. Sometimes it goes to a player who doesn't really need it, uh, but it's, it's a decent card. Secret Vigil is a very good card. You attach it to an enemy and then that enemy gets minus one threat strength. So you could put this on an enemy in the staging area and then you, it's, it's essentially adding one willpower to your questing for one cost. That's pretty good as it is. But then the response is just awesome. It says, when the attached enemy is destroyed, you reduce each player's threat by the attached enemy's printed threat. So if you attach this to a three threat strength enemy, every player is reducing their threat by three just for a cost of one. That's really good. And this is one of the few threat reduction options in tactics. Tactics usually doesn't have threat reduction as a normal option. So that's really cool to add in especially in like trap decks. Uh, trap decks need a low threat, so this card really helps in those. Raven Winged Helm is a really good card, but you got to attach it to a Sentinel Hero. So you might as well say attached to Baragon. This card was made for Baragon from the Gondor starter deck because Baragon will reduce the cost of all weapon and armor attachments by two, so this is free on Hero Baragon, but you could put it on other Sentinel Heroes, it's fine. Uh, the response is exhaust Raven Winged Helm to cancel one point of damage just dealt to the attached character. I already talked about previously how damage cancellation is so good, so I'm not going to repeat that here. It's just being able to do that once per round again on a Sentinel Hero is really, really good. So this is an interesting card. This is called Reinforcements. You have to use resources from three different heroes' pools. So generally speaking, that means you have to play a mono leadership deck, but there are ways to add leadership sphere to other heroes, so it doesn't need to be three leadership heroes, but that's normally how it's gonna be played. And then essentially, this is like a group sneak attack. Okay, so sneak attack puts in one ally from your own hand. This says the players as a group can put up to two allies into play from their hands. So choose two allies from any player's hands, and they enter play under any player's control. So that's kind of cool. You can also choose who controls them. But at the end of the phase, each of those allies go back into their hands if they're still in play. So group sneak attack, that's kind of cool. I haven't ever used the card, but I could see it being really useful, especially if you got like a Gandalf and another cool ally that you want to play. Works well with Sylvans too. All right, Elf Friend. Uh, this is an interesting card. It, it gives the Noldor and Sylvan trait to a character. Uh, I'm not going to go over all the different uses for this. It's just, uh, um, it, it's interesting. It's an enabler. A lot of people use this on the Prince Immerhill hero, Tactics Prince Immerhill, from the Dream Chaser cycle because he can put allies into play that share traits with him. So if you give him the Noldor and Sylvan traits, then he can play Sylvan allies from his deck, which can be pretty cool. Uh, there's some other really good uses for it. It lets you put Noldor and Sylvan attachments on other characters, but anyway, it is what it is. Uh, Sword Thane is a unique attachment. It's four cost, very expensive, but it turns an ally into a hero. That's really cool. There's only one other card in the game that can do this. Uh, that is the Messenger of the King contract, but it turns a starting hero, it turns an ally into a starting hero. So this lets you add an additional hero to the table, meaning you've got four heroes then with this sword thane on the table. Um, there are, again, lots of complicated uses for sword thane, but essentially most attachments in the game can only go on heroes. So if you want to put attachments on a certain ally, um, it has to be a unique ally. Uh, you want to put like an unexpected courage on someone like Faramir, then you can do that with Sword Thane. So there's lots of cool uses for it. It's just, you got to really think ahead to which unique allies you'd want to kind of trick out with some attachments or do some special things with heroes. Uh, that card would also gain resources every round. So after four rounds, this pays for itself, but that, that is a steep cost to swallow up front. Uh, so very interesting card. It's a great way to round out this box. I've got a bunch of other Lord of the Rings videos that I'll link here on the screen. Be sure to check those out. Hit subscribe, like the video if you thought this was useful. Thanks everyone for watching. Godspeed.